Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Talk, talk is dangerous. Stacy Herbert. Max, yeah. it is so dangerous. I wore my hummingbird today. A very, very quiet little bird here. Let me get a close look at that. <laughs> because, you know, the ECB, the EFSF, the IMF, the World Bank, the Fed, the BOE all agree that we can't talk the truth here in the financial world. Here's a little video clip I want to turn to, and this is the former Greek finance minister, Yanos Papantonio, and he's uh, talking about this rumors of a 50% uh, haircut in Greek debt. Will this solution, or could a solution, should a solution require a 50% haircut, as, as I believe the current finance minister has suggested? No, the current finance minister has, has refuted this, and this is a dangerous, a very dangerous proposition for Greece, because uh, default of equal to 50% will set in motion CDS, uh, will may set in motion a financial crisis in Greece, and there are very serious contagion effects to the rest of the Eurozone. And I think discussion on such options uh, is, not, is not helpful. The truth is trading down. It's in a bear market. Lies are trading up. It's a bull market in lies and silence about lies. Yes, so the talk is dangerous, he said. It's not the actual financial and economic system that we live in that is the danger. It's the talk that is causing the CDS spreads to widen. It is the talk that is causing Greece to collapse under, it has nothing to do with the austerity measures or anything like that. Right, well, Giannis Papantonio has financial herpes. I mean, that's, and he doesn't want to talk about it, understandably. But the cure for financial herpes, Giannis Papantonio, is you got to talk about it. You got to go to the doctor or whatever, and you got to take care of your financial herpes. I realize it's embarrassing, and you shouldn't have been fornicating with the IMF. They gave you the financial herpes. Now you're a pariah. So, of course, Max, the Finns never talk. They're very famously quiet. <laughs> and, lo and behold, Finnish parliament approves stronger EFSF. Well, what is it? EFSF is European Financial Stability Fund. This is yet another financially engineered pool of toxic financial junk that they have birthed into existence through Blythe Masters' birth canal, uh, through neoliberal claptrap. And they're hoping that this is somehow going to wash away their sins, but it exacerbates the sins. It makes it much worse. And the Finnish parliament, shame on you, because you were, had the right idea at first uh, by saying no, because you're against financial terrorism, but now some, somewhere in the fin Finnish parliament, somebody took a bribe, now, Max, obviously. They had to be quiet. They were told they had one guy who spoke up. And he was dangerous. He said the wrong thing. He was put away. Now all they had to do is raise their hand and be good little bailout artists. That's what they did. Bailout artists, con artists, they're all the same. Poor Finnish people. Terrible. Let's move on to what is not considered dangerous talk by these financial elite. EU's Barroso calls on ECB to do whatever it takes in crisis. There he is, that little picture of Jose Manuel Barroso, the European Commission president, standing at the podium, free to speak to the world, this garbage. He says, we trust that the European Central Bank will do whatever is necessary to ensure the integrity of the euro area and to ensure its financial stability. Well, Barroso wants to consolidate the banks. They want to create a euro bond. They want centralization of power. They want loss of sovereignty of the euro countries, increase the power of Brussels and the European Commission. He's completely spewing nonsense. He's anti-competitive. Let me explain something, Stacey Herbert. The solution to these banking problems is to be pro-competitive. That would mean fostering competition in the banking sector, not creating more too big to fail banks that by definition are not competitive. That's what Barroso was talking about. He doesn't understand a thing about economics, finance, or markets. He should be removed immediately. Yeah, but Max, your talk is considered dangerous, and yet we, this man's talk is not considered dangerous. And yet hundreds of years of history have shown and demonstrated without a doubt that centralization is dangerous. He is putting us in a more dangerous position. The, the thought of the, that the ECB can rescue the financial system that was birthed in its own image. 
They're forcing a collision in the Eurozone between different countries. France and Germany will be at war. Germany will be at war with the rest of Eurozone. This is exactly what the Euro was set up to avoid. Barroso was saying, no, no, we want World War III, and we want a huge inter scene in war in Europe. That would make us all rich, wouldn't it? Well, Barroso is celebrated because he's saying we must trust in the ECB. Only the central banks can save us. So let's go to the other major central bank in the world, and that's the U.S. Federal Reserve. Here comes Fiat Tech Watch. Ben Big Brother Bernanke goes Watergate, prepares to eavesdrop on everything mentioning the Fed. Yes, the Fed is apparently seeking the creation of a social listening platform so they can see who's talking about them and importantly, note when they're making negative comments and perhaps intervene and, and prevent this negative comments from happening. No, this is some of the in unintended consequences of the Patriot Act. This is the paranoia of the Fed. Uh, they're breaching all kinds of laws. Again, Another unintended consequence of Barack Obama giving blanket immunity to Verizon and other telecom companies when they were caught spying on people. So now Bernanke wants to just do wholesale spying on people uh, to try and figure out who out there is trying to get rid of the Fed in this paranoid, schizophrenic, delusional mindset he's got. Let me just point one thing out, Ben Bernanke. I am volunteering to come to Washington to help you straighten out your problem. If you read everything I've ever written and you eavesdrop on me all day long and stick a video camera up my sphinx fang, you'll find out that everything I've said it can only help you do your job better as a responsible person if you want to get out of the business of financial terrorism. But I don't think you want to get out of the business of financial terrorism because you're an ideologue and you are part and parcel with those very elements that are destroying economies using suicide bombs. You're a suicide banker. He doesn't need this fancy schmancy expensive software. All he has to do is go to google.com, enter Ben Bernanke. Oh, look, the third search, Ben Bernanke drunk. Well, okay, okay well, there you have it. I mean, they're going to spend millions, hundreds of millions, building a, a spying platform when they just enter into Google Ben Bernanke, and it's clear the problem is that he's an alcoholic. That's what people are saying about him. Let's look at Twitter, Max. I'm going to do a search there. Rhonda Bentz writes, has anyone seen Ben Bernanke? He owes me money. Ben Bernanke, give Rhonda Bentz her money back. Let's look at this tweet here. Mark Faber says the Federal Reserve is a criminal organization. That didn't take too long, did it? See, Ben, you just have to tune into this episode of the Kaiser Report and uh, give us how much, how much you think they're giving away for this software program. Well, I'll fly to Washington for free and sort them through their problems. But, uh, you know, if, if you're going to uh, put me through changes, uh, I'm going to have to charge you accordingly like 50 or 60 million bucks. Now, let's move on to another one of these international financial institutions, these masters of the financial universe who say, you little people down there, speak only kindly of us, otherwise the system will collapse. Here is Timothy Geithner. Geithner says new democracies need inclusive economies. So this was Timothy Geithner speaking before the annual meeting of the IMF and World Bank. And he said, the fate of democracy in North Africa and the Middle East depends on building economies that help the youth of those nations. Democracy counts on this. Yeah, unemployment in America is at 25% amongst the youth. Exactly, and in Egypt it's the same. The same. In Tunisia, it's a little bit more, 30%. So he's saying uh, democracy counts on including the youth. Now, we know that the U.S. and all of Europe, they've excluded the youth. So what is he saying? What is he telling us? I think what he's saying is democracy, according to Tim Geithner, depends on creating a Hitler youth. I think he's saying he, in fact, there is no more democracy. We do notice that. We see that when we were saying earlier, Barroso wants integration, consolidation, more power in the authority of the European Central Bank and the European Commission. They're openly telling you 
the ingredients of a democracy means you have to have jobs. Well, there's nothing coming along that line. They have no jobs for you, Max Kaiser, or the people out there. No, Bernanke and Geithner, they chose in America, when they confronted with the crisis in 2008, to bail out the creditors and the underwater mortgage holders instead of trying to help the people who are working or saving money in the capitalist system. We know where the bread is buttered for them. We know whose side that they're on. They're on the side of the speculators and the terrorists. Geithner's words mean nothing. He's a pathological liar. Well, let's Google Tim Geithner right now, Max. Google.com. Enter Tim Geithner. Oh, oh, I see Tim Geithner. Tax evasion. Very interesting for the man who heads, essentially, the IRS in America. That's right. He cheated on his taxes. <laughs> TurboTax Timmy. He said, oh, the TurboTax, my software for doing my taxes must have made a mistake. Hey. Oh, it also says Timmy Geithner grew up next to Max Kaiser. <laughs> it's true. He used to play in Flint Park. <laughs> it's a little park in Larchmont, New York. And I could see he had the eyes of the devil. All the mothers at point say, stay away from Tim Geithner. He's the devil. So final headline here, Max, speaking of tax evasion, Greece runs out of ink, can't print tax forms. So this is Zero Hedge, and they caught a good little piece in the uh, Financial Times article about the austerity measures. And they note that conservative opposition New Democracy Party said a shortage of ink had prevented the computerized tax center at the finance ministry from sending out claims to taxpayers over the last 10 days. Yes, this resonates throughout history, doesn't it? Because remember, after uh, World War I, the interregnum between World War II, they ran out of ink in Germany <laughs> when they were printing up the uh, Reichsmark. Uh, they only had one side printed. Similarly today, there's Bernanke, there's Geithner. They can run those printing presses all day long, but eventually they're going to run out of ink. They're running out of gold and silver, despite all of the uh, machinations of J.P. Morgan to artificially keep those prices down. They're running out of the basic supplies that one needs to run an economy. You see commodity prices are with, out of reach for the companies that need these things to create a functional economy. And there's Geithner, Bernanke, running out of ink. Now, as our friend Gerald Salente says, most of it's electronic, and what he would say, of course, is that the electronic money is not worth the paper it's not printed on. So they're going to run out of atoms at some point, because why? They just discovered that some neutrinos travel faster than light. Well, if Geithner and Bernanke have their way, that means they're going to print money faster than light itself. My final comment on this, Max, is that it looks like this is the hyperinflation of all of these elaborate schemes and acronyms meant to bail us out. There's hyperinflation and taxes and new taxes and nickel and diming. And we see that just like when the Reichsmark ran out of ink to print uh, the Reichsmark. Here we're running out of ink to actually print all the new taxes that are required to pay for the bankers. But remember, don't talk about it. Stacey Herbert, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming away, so stay right there. Welcome to the future, bringing you the latest in science and technology from around Russia. We've got the future covered. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to New York. Speak with actress, comedian, writer, director, producer, Roseanne Barr. Roseanne is an Emmy and Golden Globe winning performer for her role as a fierce working class domestic goddess on the hit comedy show Roseanne. Roseanne Barr, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Hey, thank you very much. Now, Roseanne, we met on Twitter via hashtag Occupy Wall Street. Uh, tell us how you ended yeah, up. Yeah, we did. How did we? How did you end up speaking at Occupy Wall Street, and what is the mood there? I ended up speaking there to announce my uh, candidacy for president of these United States, as well as prime minister of Israel. It's a twofer, 
And so I went over there, you know, to give my speech, and I've traveled all over the country giving that speech now for about a year. The mood there, it was pretty fantastic. It was very calm, very peaceful, uh, a, a lot of deep thought, a lot of solutions being put forth, a lot of really cool young people, some older people, but it's kind of a real, like, reminds me of the 60s when we all uh, kind of tried to do the exact same thing. Okay, now, Roseanne, when I was in Tahrir Square in Cairo uh, during their protests, I noticed that their demands of the protesters were very clear. Now, uh, what are the demands of the Occupy Wall Street protests? Well, as far as I could tell, you know, uh, you know that people have made the connection between foreclosures, banks, war, and uh, but that's why I'm here, Max, because you said you had solutions, and that's why I followed you and tweeted you back, and I thought your solutions sound pretty brilliant, so I'm here. Uh, to ask you questions as well. Yeah, I saw you on Twitter. Uh, twi you were tweeting from the Occupy Wall Street. You were, you're down in the trenches. And uh, one of the tweets that you posted, uh, you said, Roseanne Barr, if corporations are people, uh, then Goldman Sachs needs to be executed for premeditated mass murder, terrorism, mayhem, and grand larceny. Yes, absolutely. Would this be your, your platform then, uh, running for president? It's part of it. Is the part of my platform is, of course, that the guilty must be punished, and that we can no longer, you know, ha let our children see their guilty leaders getting away with murder, um, because it teaches children that you know they don't have to have any morals, and as long as they uh, have guns and are bullies, that they'll win. And I don't think that's a good message. I do say that I am for the return of the guillotine, and um, that that is for the worst of the worst of the guilty. You're singing to the choir on this show. We've been advocating the guillotine for years now. Oh, well, fantastic. We think alike in, in many ways. I first would allow the guilty bankers to pay, you know, the ability to pay back anything over 100 million personal wealth, uh, because I believe in a maximum wage of $100 million. And if they're unable to live on that amount, then they should, you know, go to the re-education camps. And if that doesn't help, then be beheaded. Now, uh, we just recently saw the guillotine rolled out in a huge protest in Israel, 500,000 people in the streets. Basically, they are part of this global, what some call or I call the global insurrection against banker occupation. Has there been any communication between, let's say, the Tel Aviv, Wall Street, Athens, Cairo, Tunis? This is a global uprising. Uh, do you see any of that global yes. communication happening vis-a-vis -vis Twitter and other sites or just uh, in, in any way? Yes, I receive emails and messages and letters from all over the world, especially Israel and uh, Turkey and even Iran, everywhere. I, I, I see it all, and I just encourage everybody, get together as fast as you can. Stop all that uh, lefty factioning stuff that leftist men love to do. Women, come together, and it's ours, and we'll take it, and we'll fix it in a heartbeat. Okay, on the Twitterosphere front, uh, we have some questions from Twitter. Uh, I'm going to ask you a, a few Twitter questions. What, this one's from Bloated Lesbian, asks via Twitter. <laughs> I've seen her. That's a funny name. <laughs> she asked, if given the opportunity to confront Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon, what would Roseanne Barr say to them? Uh, you're under arrest. Short and sweet. Okay, next question from Bill Twaddle on Facebook. He asks, would you support an Occupy the Fed protest? seeing as without the corruption uh, there, the banking fraud couldn't continue. So this is a question about getting a little bit more fine-tuned and, and, and maybe occupying the, the, the nexus of this problem, the Federal Reserve. Absolutely. They got to go. They're out of here. As soon as I'm elected, that will be my first act. First, first I will make war illegal, I'll get rid of the war on drugs and all other fake wars that we, we're losing in the United States, and I'll kick out the Fed, and, and, uh, and I'll legalize marijuana and, and forgive all American working debt. Okay, now those positions sound roughly similar to Ron Paul. Yeah, but I'm not against, I'm not against big government. I love big government, because if it was not for big government, we never would have built a middle class in this country. So I advocate a return to farming, and I have put all, most of my personal wealth into uh, returning America to, to be the breadbasket of the world, because that is exactly what built a middle class in this country. 
And so I'd like to see a return to that. And, you know, I advocate organic farming, heirloom seeds, and end to the Monsatan Corporation, which is poisoning the web of life. And just common sense solutions to what seems like insurmountable problems, but are actually very simple. All right, I want to now talk about solutions, because we started out the interview saying we would get into some possible solutions for Occupy Wall Street. And we promised people in the Occupy Wall Street that we would talk about some solutions. Now, uh, let me put something out there, which is that the, um, the blood that makes the occupation of the banksters work, their, their stock and trade is their stock price. So therefore, in, in order to attack the banksters, one first has to accept that you need to decapitalize them. Not decapitate them, that could come later. But initially, they need to be, decap they need to be decapitalized that is to say, drive their stock price down in some way. I see we're on the same page there. And while I'm talking about natural capitalism that's based on like things that grow out of the earth that we can actually eat, that have actual value, that aren't about fake money and pretend fiat currency, uh, I think we're on the same page there, aren't we? I think so. And uh, other campaigns in the past that have been more narrow in their focus and have gone after, let's say, companies that were involved in uh, animal rights, uh, they're being uh, attacked by animal rights advocates for using animals in testing. They brought risk to the balance sheet of those companies. I'm thinking of Stop Huntington Life Sciences. And that stock price went to zero, and it had a tremendous effect. That seems to be a model that could be transitioned to the Occupy Wall Street thinking process. What do you think? I love it. I, that's why I came on to hear more from you. Could you break it down and like say it simply? Tell people out there that don't have, you know, they, you know, that may not, just give them the simplest thing to do. What, what do you suggest the simplest thing we all could do would be? Go through J.P. Morgan's books with a fine tooth comb, find out where they're breaking the law, and then make it known to the money managers in the world how they're breaking the law, thus putting risk on their balance sheet and driving that stock price down. Clearly, they're breaking the law, but the money managers still hold the stock because they haven't been told. Once they're told, they have a legal responsibility to act. It's all about putting risk back to them where it came from. Okay, all requires just a simple analysis of uh, their, S, uh, their 10K, their 10Qs, their SEC filings, where they're hiding their criminality, their criminal behavior, their financial terrorism. Make a big issue of it, and their money managers, by law, must sell the stock. And then, the, to, to add a kicker to this, you can actually encourage hedge funds to attack the stock also by selling it short. So you're leveraging the system against the system instead of being victimized. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. I think that, uh, you know, there's one big company that ev everybody should, uh, should, like, focus on, and we all know who that is. All right, now, finally, last question. As you head back to Los Angeles, Roseanne Barr, are you taking the Occupy Wall Street fight with you? And if so, how so? I just continue to uh, encourage people and to join them when I can all, all over the place. And uh, if I can't, like, be in Egypt or Tel Aviv, I have friends there, and I, I uh, send them encouraging, heartening messages that, uh, you know, to continue because uh, we're fighting an enemy, I think, that uh, can go down easily. And uh, the more people know and the more aware they are, the easier it's getting. And people are getting aware and more aware every second of how interconnected and how small the group at the top, that 1%. There are not very many of them. Right, there's only a few hundred, actually. And um, yeah. so let, just to get this straight. And point. some of them could actually, I think, be shamed into doing something different because a lot of them have souls and are human. And, uh, you know, they could come over to the side where you, you don't make blood money anymore because, I mean, we're not, this, this world is beyond living as one blood cult at war with another one. We're, we're in a whole other world now. And so we encourage them to, you know, become aware and join the land of the living. All right, finally, another uh, Facebook question from uh, Luis uh, Schulborg. It's a question about how did you come to your current thinking politically? Uh, was there an event in your life, or how did you uh, first get into your political point of view? Well, I was always political because my father, my grandfather, they were very political. I, I lived in, Sol I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. I was 
a, a Jewish girl, and uh, that was a little difficult. But also, my family were socialists, so they were. I was like a red diaper, a little late for that. But I always was political because my family was always political. So, you know, once you once you're trained to see everything in a, which to me means you just see how things are connected. That's what political means to me. It doesn't mean like taking a side or voting or any of that stuff. It just means being aware of how things are interconnected. Okay, and then on the economy front now, we're saying the exact same thing about the global economy. How are things connected and how are we getting abused? Well, we're gonna have to figure that out. Um, and, and I think we will figure it out and I think we are figuring it out. But of course, I, I just, if I was president, I'd just get rid of all currencies and begin a, a new currency based on barter and actual value of vegetables. And I've said that I would, I would uh, you know, replace all dead, systems based on war and blood cults with a new kind of thinking that's about you know getting the food to the hungry because uh, that's a simple problem actually and yet we never you know politics and uh, and and government prevent us from doing even the most basic things to save ourselves so I think we just need to let it go because I think it's falling and it'll be it'll fall no matter if we come up with uh, our own Ponzi schemes and push it over. It's already fallen, and I think we need to get something new real quick, because uh, when currencies fall, that means food shortages come next, and you know it's not looking pretty. So, I think we need a whole new way of backing off from a dead and dying system and creating a new living one. All right, Roseanne Barr. That's all the time we have. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacy Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Roseanne Barr. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.